Hello, everyone, and welcome to the September 11th episode of Pub Talk Live, the live publishing talk show airing the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I'm a young adult author, a board member, an agent liaison for tours, and a library event planner. You can subscribe to Reminders via email by clicking the link in the description so you don't miss a show. If you want to support the show or some of the other things I do, like the podcast, you can find a link to the Patreon near the end of the video description as well. So I'm going to go ahead and bring on our fabulous guest co-host today. I'm so excited for today's episode. So um, Nina LaCour is the best-selling and Michael L. Prince award-winning author of five critically acclaimed young adult novels published by Penguin Random House, including We Are Okay and Watch Over Me. She is also the co-author of You, Knew, you Know Me Well, a novel written in collaboration with David Levithan and published by St. Martin's Griffin, and a contributor to numerous anthologies, including Summer Days and Summer Nights, edited by Stephanie Prickins. Her first novel for adults, Yerba Buena, is forthcoming from Flatiron Books in February of 2022, and her first picture book, Mommy, Mama and Mommy and Me in the Middle, is also forthcoming in 2022 from Candlewick. She lives with her wife and daughter in San Francisco and teaches an online writing class called The Slow Novel Lab. So please welcome Nina to the show. Hello. Hi. There we go. Hi. I was so good with my mute button and then not fast enough. <laughs> um, welcome to Palm Talk Live. I'm so excited you agreed to come on today. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so excited about our guest, though I know we have <laughs> lots to do before we before we get there. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of regulars in the comments saying hi. hi. Our, our Danny says hi, Pubbers. Pubbers is like what the regulars from my show call themselves, which is hi. awesome. Hi, Jensen. everyone. Laura says hi, Nina. Jay, hello. Mm -hmm. Danny loves your bangs. <laughs> Thank you so much. I almost I, I almost trimmed them right before this and I don't <laughs> have enough time. So, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, how is San Francisco right now? How's the weather there? It's like stupid hot in Florida still. So this is like the most warm, sunny time of year in San Francisco, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that it's very hot. Like it's, we're like, oh, it's 72. How lovely, let's have a picnic. Um, but I actually, I live in a part of the city that is almost always sunny. We don't get the fog that San Francisco is famous for. So um, mm. it's been a beautiful summer and it's, yeah, I'm just gonna enjoy it as long as it lasts. Nice. nice. My friend went to visit somewhere recently and um, that's not really hot usually, but they had a heat wave and she was messaging me and she was like, it got to 81 today. And this was at 1am my time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it is 82 degrees right now at 1am. <laughs> <Like, laughs> so I'm, I'm always like living vicariously through other people's weather. All right. Yeah. Um, so our VR poll today is in honor of our special guests. So, um, it's for audiobook listeners. Do you find yourself liking and seeking out specific audiobook narrators? I'm going to post the link so you can go vote. If you haven't voted yet, it'll close around 930. And then we'll discuss it at the end. Um, and obviously, I've written a whole book writer article about this. So obviously, I, I have feelings. And now we're going to do some news items. We have f fewer news items for you than usual. But there's still some good ones. Um, so when you search for the words COVID-19 or vaccine on Amazon, the top results are for anti-vaccine books and other books and other books with medical misinformation. So Representative Adam Schiff and Senator Elizabeth Warren sent letters to Amazon this week asking for details about its misinformation policies, which most of the major web platforms have. Uh, they want Amazon to prevent its system for recommending books and other products that promote debunked conspiracy theories and other misinformation. Mm. It's just, it's wild to me that Amazon doesn't have anything in place to stop this. Yeah, I was about to say, like, literally the least they could do is provide yeah. some sort of disclaimer or filtering like, process. Yeah. I don't even care if if they are the bestsellers. Don't put them on the rankings. <laughs> like, yeah. um, all right, yeah, that right. that blew my mind. Um, this is a good time to mention if you want any more information about any of the news items that we talk about, uh, the links will be posted in the description after the show ends, so uh, you can go and read about that or anything else that we're going to be talking about after the show. And if you're watching the replay, obviously they're already there. <laughs> 
All right, so Humble Bumble has partnered with Stephen King to release an exclusive new short story to benefit the ACLU. This is the first venture for Humble Exclusive, which will feature partnerships with creators for exclusive content that will support charities. Sounds good. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Have you ever used Humble Bumble? I never have. To be honest, I, I don't really know what it is. Can you tell me? Yeah, well, I mainly know about from because I listen to like a lot of indie author podcasts and stuff, and um, and some indie authors use it, where they'll put like a whole bunch of books together, and then it's kind of a pay what you will platform. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's primarily a promotion for them, right, to get like a whole bunch of books, and then you, you use that like group promotion, um, but it's also used for software and there's something else that is used for it. basically digital project products okay. um you can put on there and then that benefits uh charity oh that's so great I'll have yeah to check it out. that's really cool um and it's cool that stephen king is doing something with them and it seems like they have a whole thing planned so we'll keep an eye out yeah that's great all right <laughs> <laughs> There's a horse dewormer conversation happening. I'm just ignoring it right now. <laughs> um, all right. It seems like every episode we're talking about an equity firm buying another publishing company, which is kind of, I don't know, it's depressing. But this week, Follett sold its K-12 through software and content division to investment firm Francisco Partners. That's just that for the, that that division it doesn't include like their college or baker and taylor stuff well it said that the pandemic didn't have a huge effect on their need to sell which is interesting mm -hmm. yeah that is interesting it's yeah it's impossible to keep up with who is buying what all the time right <laughs> yeah i did see i didn't put it in the news items because i thought it was kind of a boring thing but i also saw Bertelsmann, which is the owner of penguin house Penguin Random House. Mm -hmm. um, they apparently have had such a great like couple of quarters with PRH that mm -hmm. they are actually looking into buying more publishing businesses. Oh wow! Because they're wow. like, I don't know, making money off of it. So, oh my god! <laughs> Good luck that, to everyone. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that is wild. That is wild. <laughs> all right, we'll we'll keep an eye on that. Um, all right, so the book publishing industry is still suffering from supply chain issues, including labor shortages and transportation delays. Insiders say the issues are even worse than last year and will continue until at least next spring. Many publishers are scrambling and prioritizing their biggest titles. I have to say, when I when I read that one, I got a little nervous with two books coming out in early 2022. It's not the kind of news that um, any author wants to hear. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely heard of authors getting their books pushed back like the week before. Wow. Um, which is just like, as a former publicist, it's like a nightmare, right? Because you've like <laughs> planned all your publicity efforts. Um, yeah, it's it's rough. Um, the article again is going to be in the comments. I I recommend if you're interested in this kind of thing, like check it out because um, it's kind of sad but uh i mean every every industry is having supply issue problems you know so yeah yeah all right prepared. um so we discussed in the last episode how the beijing international book fair postponed the event the day before it was set to begin <laughs> which <laughs> gives me anxiety <laughs> um, that went over really well <laughs> yeah so they rescheduled it this blows my mind. I'm sorry. September 14th through the 18th. <laughs> Wait, like in a week <laughs> or not even a week in yeah. three days. <laughs> and like, what, what are they doing in China that they can do stuff like this? So last wow. minute, I'm just, oh, okay. Um, I'm like having panic right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in other major book fair news, the Frankfurt Book Fair has reconfirmed that it's going forward with an in-person activities in late October. Uh, they've limited, att <laughs> limited attendance to 25,000 mm -hmm. a day and are requiring a vaccination or a recent negative test result or proof that you've recovered from COVID recently. I wonder okay. just like logistically how that will work. You know, that seems like a massive number of people to, um, you know, enforce yeah. that sort of thing. You know, like uh, other book fairs that are like much smaller are looking at that, like limited attendance to 25,000 being like jealous. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I really want to go to Frankfurt one day 
Me too. We should go together. Yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> After all of this mess, <laughs> the pandemic mess, let's go. Yeah, in 2025 when it's finally yeah. safe to do so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So good news for bookish podcast fans. The Library of Congress and NPR are partnering to produce a National Book Festival podcast series. The series will be published across several of NPR's podcasts, including Light Kit, Shortwave, Code Switch, and TED Radio Hour. I will definitely be listening to that. Yeah, um, I I looked at it and I was like, oh, I already subscribed to all those. I don't have to add a different subscription. <laughs> <laughs> all of NPR podcasts. So, yeah. Um, oh, Laura said Faith Hunter had a book book pushback this month. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, all right. Oh. If it's affecting Faith Hunter, like, <laughs> what hope do I have? Uh, I don't have any books coming out, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna bring on our special guest now. I'm super excited for this. I just need to switch this layout real quick so we don't get a weird layout. Um, all right, Georgina Marie is a television writer on the forthcoming Disney show, Mickey Mouse Funhouse, a nationally touring comedian opening for Richard Lewis, Kathleen Madigan, and Louis, is, I don't know, Louis Anderson? Louis, I don't know. Sorry, I should have asked about that. We're not, we're not comedian, Georgina, forgive us. <laughs> I'm the author of Improv for Writers, which I just read last week. She is an award-winning voice actress you may have heard on Nickelodeon or Disney and has narrated over 400 audiobooks. She has earned a prestigious Audi, more than a dozen earphones awards, and has been named one of the best YA voices for several consecutive years. She has also written on television shows for DreamWorks, Cartoon Network, and Netflix. She writes about comedy for Writer's Digest magazine and is included in Writer's Digest Best Of. So please welcome Georgina to the show. Yay. Hello. Hello. Georgina was also on my book write list of my personal favorite narrators, but that's not included in the bio. So <laughs> I'm putting it in my bio. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for having me. I am, this, I am delighted to be here and with, you know, one of my favorite authors in the whole wide world and persons. So um, I'm just honored. Thank you for making this space for me, Sarah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited. Danny says, hey, Georgina. Hey, Danny. <laughs> Um, before before yeah. we started rolling, I was I was saying how excited I was to be invited to do this one because I just admire Georgina so much. We've gotten to do a couple live things together mm. over the years, or at least one live thing and then a few virtual things, and it's just always such a pleasure. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And the the funny thing is, is we don't talk about it, but when, when we do these events, sometimes we're wearing the same colors. Do you remember <laughs> the Texas book <laughs> fest? <was> uh, <laughs> just like matching. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> um, it's a bit yeah. of a mutual like admiration love fest because I really have a lot of respect for Nina as an author and a teacher, which is mm -hmm. um, really extraordinary. I've, gotten to, you know, be a part of her, I mean, just fantastic teacher, which is something that I probably not a lot of people know about, you know, and the ones who are lucky enough to know, they know. <laughs> Thanks, <Regina. laughs> uh, My uh, regulars are calling me out. I can confirm Sarah was super excited about this. <laughs> Yay, well, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, I'm such a big fan of both of yours. So, like, um, sometimes I, like, I forget because I'm like too busy, like scheduling everything and, you know, getting all the bios and making the promo. And just like at some point today, I was like, oh, my God, I get to talk to Neil Corr and Georgina Marie today. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, Georgina, we have some questions for you. Uh, the conversation on the show is pretty casual. So, like, feel free, you know, like it's not super um, regimented. Um, so if you if you think of a story you want to tell or whatever, just go for it. Um, so, but my first question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about the process when it comes to recording an audiobook? So what happens from like when you first get the manuscript until you, you know, send off your files? Absolutely. I, so it depends on, um, kind of if it's a series, that's like where there's sort of a difference. If it's part of a series, like I do all the Nancy Drew, the new Nancy Drew diaries, and I know those characters really well, so I can... 
I can read through those a little with a little bit more speed, but I do find that the best prep is what I do, what I've sort of over time, I figured it out, but it's really spending time with that first novel and letting the first read through of it. So reading the manuscript twice. So each time, so first time to get a feel for it, look up things, understand vibe, and even sometimes like playing certain music and just kind of getting into a little bit of a zone when it's like, cause there's such an, a, a a variety of audiobooks that I do. So it's kind of different depending on the, the tone of it. But mostly it's like preparing the book, making sure that I'm understanding the the story, the characters have a sense of um, what they'll be. Cause sometimes there'll be like a lot of characters that are similar. So I have to spend a little bit of time figuring out how can I make each one different for the listener mm -hmm. because they don't have visuals to figure out oh, like this, it's this kind of girl or this kind of you know if there's a lot of or a lot of male characters like how can they be separate um yeah so it's a, a little bit of a little bit of work and then when I go in the booth it tends to be just sort of trusting that it'll come through you know and I don't do a, a ton of rehearsals or a ton of takes it's it tends to be like if I make a mistake go back and pick that up and then if I'm fortunate enough to be working with a director th sometimes they'll say they'll catch, you know, this voice sounded a little bit like that other character that's very similar. And I know we're working on making sure that they're, they're different. So we're thinking about all of those things. Um, either I'm thinking about it by myself and, um, but, but mostly I get to work with a director and they're helping with that process. And they're sometimes the unsung heroes of audiobooks is mm -hmm. that they do catch a lot of things. And sometimes they'll, we'll re-record the entire first chapter. I know, I, I know I've done that with one of Nina's books before um, with the direct with the director that I was working with because you go into the studio and you're sort of you know maybe it's like nine in the morning you're just like mornings I don't want them um, and so by the afternoon your voice sounds different you're in a different place with the story with the characters with the emotion and so go back and do that that first section again because it's important the very how we get into the story yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, just hearing you talk right now it makes me. Um, even though your your narrating voice is a little different sometimes than your speaking voice, like I, I just it makes me want to go and listen to one of the books that you've narrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah. I feel I feel at my best when I'm when I'm doing something like that or playing a character. I, I've always felt like that's my home. Is is like that's my creativity flow is doing my best to honor another human being and become them. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Yeah, um, I, I, sorry, I listened to an audiobook a couple of years ago that was like how to be an audiobook narrator, <laughs> uh, which is interest is like super meta, right? But um, I remember a specific, cause I was just like interested in it, you know, just from a kind of curiosity standpoint. Um, was it Jessica K? No, that name doesn't sound right. Um, it was a woman who does a lot of romance. Okay. Um, I don't know. I have, I have to look it up. But um, one of the things that she talked about was building up stamina. Like, because most people, if they, if they haven't done that kind of work before, they can't just, like, go and do several hours in a day. And I was like, that's I, I, that makes sense, of course. But, like, um, it's interesting. Yeah, I would, I would add to like the original question of like preparation is like the physical preparation of it, like moving in between things, moving mm -hmm. beforehand. I have a trampoline. I jump on that to get my energy up. I do breath work. I do meditation. When, when I meditate beforehand, I make way less mistakes. So there's a lot of like trip, trips, chip, chip. I was trying to say tips and tricks at the same time. So you know, these uh, tricks of the trade that, that you do. But one of the big ones also is drinking a lot of water because mm -hmm. I'm, I can hear I'm a little scratchy because I didn't have as much water as I would normally today. And I'm like, got my water here. Um, but uh, having like a whole bunch of it even before you go into the booth so you don't get to that point where now we're trying to work backwards and get rid of whatever might be coming in to show tiredness or the voice kind of like being a little bit exhausted because there's sprays, there's teas, but um, the best is just the, you know, preventative things that you can do like sleep and water and, 
an, an exercise really. I also do acupuncture and I get my sinus points done. I've had um, asthma and allergies all my life. And mm -hmm. um, I've had producers tell me like, you sound really nasally in the beginning, especially you sound really nasally and um, it affected, it affected the work that I got. And as soon as I found a great acupuncturist, I actually did start working more. So it was sort of a funny mm -hmm. thing. Cause I just told her like, when we figured all these things out, like, nope, can't eat cheese. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> Forget it. Forget cool. it, Wisconsin. We'll put Wisconsin out of business. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So many, so many things to consider. And it's so inspiring. Like as you talk about that, it makes me think, like when you mentioned, especially like meditation or the trampoline, like all of these things that we can do, like for you with your narration work, but I think of it for me with writing too, like things that I can do and getting a good night's sleep and being hydrated, like all of those things can help. Um, I feel like so many different creative processes. I feel like we're the result of our habits. Mm -hmm. Like we really used to really start to see it. Yeah. And feel yeah. It. Not to bring everybody down, <laughs> but also like we can do something about it. But I, I hope I didn't interrupt you, Sarah. You were with, okay. okay. No, um, what was it? Oh, what I was thinking was, because you had said like you narrate like different kinds of um, characters and Nina actually has a question for you about that. But I was thinking about specifically, um, so Michael Crouch is another one of my favorite audiobook narrators. Yeah, right? <laughs> and he, he does a together. Oh, did you? Yeah. Which one? Which I'm one? sure I've listened to them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Salt I can't. Yeah. Oh, oh, I just knocked stuff over. Um, it's an extraordinary story. Where does it yeah. Go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's on my list. I actually have it on hold at the library. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but so he does a lot of YA, right? And he's often kind of like, he does a lot of like nerdy kind of male characters or, you know, that kind of thing. And then he narrated Bathhouse. Do you know Bathhouse? Mm -hmm. So um, someone told me this and it was like the perfect description for this book. It's called, P it's by PJ Vernon. And they said it was Gone Girl for the Grinder set. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, um, you know, a gay male lead uh, mm -hmm. thriller with, you know, some domestic domestic thriller mm -hmm. um and it was just like so different right because it's like i'm not used to hearing him like that but it was so good it was still so good all right i'll let nina ask her uh, question i'm done well later. yeah maybe we could, let's ask you this question then like so speaking of range like you have so much range when it comes to the quality of your voice and also the the books that you choose the projects that you choose to take on um, like I love, like you can be like cartoony and funny, and then you can be also like really moody and like emotionally raw. And I just wonder, I guess there are two questions, two ways we could go with this. One is like, how do you choose your projects? I mean, I know people come to you. I imagine the publishers come to you and pitch a project and you get to choose whether to take it on or not. And then, um, also just like, like tell us the secrets of your incredible range. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I love that I get to do such an array of characters and, mm -hmm. and I, I, there's a real pure joy of working in animation or playing kids that I cannot, cannot describe. I, it's why I'm like, I, I can go off and do all kinds of things, but I love doing audiobooks. I love doing animated characters because in each of those areas of storytelling, you can have really grounded characters or you could have like wackadoodle characters. And mm -hmm. sometimes I'll do something and I'll just be like looking at the director going too far. Cause that's just, I just tend to like, if I can push anything, I just, I want to go big or, you know, get out of the booth. I mean, I really do, but some stories, they just, they, they're, especially Nina is they're, they're so intimate and they're so, there's like such soulfulness there as well. And I, I really started when I started narrating, I, I think I did a lot of a lot of a more emotional YA stories dealing with really serious issues that mm -hmm. sometimes I'd be prepping a book and throw it across the room because it's just so upsetting of like mm -hmm. <laughs> it only happened once, but <laughs> deservedly so because just because it was like, oh, the story is like, you know, these what these kids are going through. Um, so I 
I, I think it's really about going back to theater and improv roots of mm -hmm. understanding tone. You know, a Shakespeare play, actually a Shakespeare play can be done in all kinds of different tones. Anything can be. It's like, what what is the tone we're going for? And um, a lot of authors, their previous work will set that tone and the director and the publisher and the author will have to let me know, like, this is a different tone than the previous work. Like, we're really going out on a limb and we want to do something like really funny or, or it's, you know, it's, you know, from reading it, it's obviously more, more serious. Um, so really tone is a huge aspect to creating anything, whether you're the author or, or the, or the narrator of understanding that we're all on the same page about these characters sort of live in this emotionless window and it's very small and not a lot gets not a lot of light gets through or just a big rainbow <laughs> we're just like throw it out there and see what splats and have fun with it and it's so it's it's really those are you know opposite ends but and everything in in between so it's it's kind of that initial understanding and i've become aware that people you know are picking their narrator. I do it too, because I listen audiobooks nonstop. I mean, I just finished one in the car and then started another one. I'm just a nonstop. I, I love it. And I love listening to my friends and um, getting stories that way because it's so it's so personal. But you, you do start listening to certain books because of the narrator. So I'm a little bit aware of that. And so sometimes there are things that I that aren't quite I, I'm not sure. I would be the best narrator for them, you know, but um, yeah, uh, the publisher will come to me and ask me to do a story. And it was for a long time. It was sort of like these emotional YA stories. And then I got to do some comedies and I was like, people were like, oh yeah, she's like a comedian. And, and those are really fun too. So I, I enjoy that. I have the, the range to do that. And I think that comes from theater and from improv where you just get to you walk out on stage and you could be, you could be a plant, you could be a roller skate, you could be a grandma, you could be a grandpa, you know, you could do, there's the, you know, it's pretty unlimited. And that's the neat thing about, you know, using your voice as well as you get to be a lot of different things. That was a long answer. <laughs> I could keep going. It was so great. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the first times I don't know if it was, it was probably was not the first time I heard you narrate a book, but the first time I, I heard you narrate a book and like noticed, you know, like sometimes you're like, you take notice, right? Mm -hmm. was actually, um, everything leads to you, which was neat. Oh, book. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I know. It was so good. Um, all right. Whew. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> um, well, wait, I, on that, on that note, I will say like, I, I rarely reread my own books. Like I only do it if I have to, like if for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. um, and actually like Georgina's narration helped me like accept my work more mm -hmm. because I'm very, I'm a very brutal critic of my own work. And so whenever I look at it on the page, like I wish I could make all of these changes and, you know, when it's past time that I can, but listening to Georgina read it, like Georgina just brings such like beauty to the work. And then I'm able to like settle into it and just enjoy it in a way that I can't enjoy it when I'm just looking at it on the page. So um, there's just more, more praise to be yeah. heaped upon you, Georgina. That's yeah. so nice to hear. I mean, I work with, there are authors that, that haven't listened to, you know, they'll, they'll meet them at conferences or, you know, in passing or whatever and get to know them a little bit, but we'll say like, people say you're great, but I can't listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Like, I, I think it's like actors not wanting to watch, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's gotta be, I mean, it's a different, you know, sort of thing. Uh, um, but I, I feel like uh, I feel like it's collaboration too. So it's an interpretation. So you know, Nina writes a beautiful book, and then I'm I'm just trying to do my best to be of that world and bring it to to life for people, um, and and um, be of, of service to this to the story. You know what what helps tell the story, and so that's that's when I'm always checking in with the director of like, did, did we go too far? You know, making, we want, we all want to make, we all, it is really a really cool world to be a part of audiobooks because really smart people 
uh, not talking about myself, <laughs> but, um, but well, it's just people who love books. And mm -hmm. so when people, you know, ask me how to, you know, they want to talk about getting started in audiobooks, my, my first question is really, do you love reading? You know, because I think that's a prerequisite. And then another one after that, especially for fiction is, do you have a, a background in theater or acting? Because it's a play, it's a play for, for like four or five days, you know, or, you know, but just, just like you, <laughs> you're showing up on the, on the stage and, and, and creating it. And I, you know, a really interesting thing happened with the last book with Nina was like, I prepped it. And then I, I had, um, I had like, a, I told Nina this too. I had a dream that like, I, I like solved something in my life. And directly after reading and then I got to go the next day and record it uh, and like felt like a different person like it was it was big like it was big because that's what stories well you know that, that that they can sometimes do that for us is like change us and yeah. I actually experienced it in between prepping the book and then and then telling the story it gives me chills even though you've already told me it gave me chills <laughs> I, I mean I get them too it was like a profound thing you know i'm not like mm -hmm. a dream interpreter but i woke up and was like <gasps> <laughs> amazing that's amazing. really great yeah. yeah um well actually that leads perfectly into the next question uh do you have any advice for people who may want to get into narrating audiobooks yeah i think it's um i think it's um asking the those questions of you know is it it really is like if if it's fiction like having a performance background because i think it really does help or um maybe it's something that you've always wanted to do and you're geared towards differentiating voices because i think if if it's not coming naturally it could be a longer road just in because then you're learning two crafts at the same time um you're you're learning acting and then you're learning in you know voiceover in the booth and controlling your voice and and things like that so um i i, I would actually say and this might be crazy but i and hard to do right now but um be in a play you know mm -hmm. be involved in in theater and be in a play or um and then if you have that kind of background it's it's uh it can kind of fold into that getting to know you know the publishers that are out there and preparing a demo is very important so and you can do that on your own you can make those on your own um it's one of the few demos that you could actually do by choosing work that would suit your voice that you would like to be working on and that is something that happens in voice in audiobooks is that you sort of get typecast you know and so for many years doing kind of a specific story which fortunately I love, mm -hmm. I love what I get to do. I mean, it is a true gift because I would re I would be reading these books anyway. Don't tell <laughs> House, don't tell a set, don't tell anybody. Um, so yeah, I think reading, reading a lot, listening to a lot of audiobooks because hearing and good narrators too. There's so many wonderful people out there, but to hear those, the pacing, and if you if you want to lay down a demo and just record like a couple of minutes of a book, the, the advice that people gave me, and I was like, oh yeah, whatever. But it's so true is to slow down. Mm -hmm. so we get in there and we start reading and you can hear a new person reading because they're going a mile a minute. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes that's called for if it's an action sequence, but even then you want the listener because you're always thinking about somebody's on the other end of this receiving and it needs to sound like you're telling a story, not reading. And so that's the key is really that translation from the ideas. It's like the translation from the author into the page, into you, and then unfolding a world, not telling, not even just telling a story because you're playing multiple characters, you're unfolding a world. So the very first introduction of a character, you want to make sure that you know those voices. So I think being, being thoughtful about it, because early on, I was probably like, I know what I'm doing. Uh, you know, you don't, I mean, you can do it for years and still be like, there's so much to learn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, would, I would say those couple of things. I don't know if that's helpful for people who might be wanting to get into it, but 
there are some really great, there are some great resources. Like my friend, Jessica K, she did write a book about it. And I, I wrote a little segment in that book for her. Um, so there's, um, that's a writer's digest book. Um, but that's, I think that's a helpful one because you also now have to know a lot technically. So it can be a bit of a learning curve if that's a, a hard part of it. And it was early on for me, but now it's like driving a car. I, I, I have it set up. I go in and I touch two buttons and I'm, we're, it's professional. It's broadcast. Like it could be, I do things all over the world and, you know, this is in my home, not that, but yeah, I'm very fortunate, very fortunate that I was able to work and have been able to do that. Yeah. It seems for, like, how long have you had your studio in your house? And what, I, and what did it look like before? Like, how has it changed that you get to, like, just do it at home? <laughs> I like this question. And I like my weird answer even more uh, because I don't always get to tell people, but, like, I have a professional studio now, but I built it. Like, I was, like, I, I did a business plan about getting into audiobooks. I sat down and did, like, a whole, like, I'm really going to do this. And I started with what I had, which was, I was really financially like not it was it was rough I had um egg crates that I'd been saving like I'm a I grew up very rural and like we didn't have very much um and we'd get our eggs from the farm next door and so when I was a kid we were we would save the cartons to take back over to the farm for the eggs because why would you throw them away when you it's just yeah you get it we all we all kind of get it now but I feel like for a long time I had to explain my sort of like, <laughs> roots but I took those egg crates from the farmer's market in LA and I put them in, I uh, cleaned out the closet because I did a job and I did a job and it wasn't an audiobook thing, but I did this voiceover thing. And the guy was like, it sounds really echoey. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and so then I started like here, like, oh, okay. So it took everything out of my closet, mm -hmm. put everything, like all the, the mic moved everything in the, in there and then put the egg crates up on the wall mm -hmm. and a blanket over them. And that was my first studio. Well, I love <laughs> it. And it worked. I did um, yeah. my first yeah. my first audio book in there, Ghost Train with um, mm -hmm. with Brilliance, and um, and then I'd done another one in there as well, like kind of a thriller. Um, but Ghost Train was a YA book, is a YA book too, and that was one of my one of my first mm -hmm. um, egg crates. <laughs> so great. Yeah, it's funny. I um, I do. I have a podcast, and I go to different like podcasting classes and stuff. And I remember I went to one where they're basically like, you have to spend like it was like thousands of dollars, like all the equipment they're recommending and everything. And this was like a for beginners kind of thing. And like that's uh, th that's not right. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was like this guy from Sure Microphones, the microphone company, who did a thing on basically how to make yourself sound better, right? And someone had asked him like, what are the best like what is what is what is a cheap way to prevent reverb right and he was like this is going to sound really like cheap but those furniture moving blankets he's like just get a couple of those and hang those up and i was like thank you like this guy gets it right <laughs> especially yeah. when you're talking to just like hobbyist podcasters you know yeah yeah and so also what you use what you have you know yeah yeah so what do you have now I have a vocal booth. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, and and um and I have I just switched everything over. I was on PC for a long time. I switched over finally to my engineer's delight. He's awesome, but um I switched over to Mac. Yeah, just um, I just ha I I was dealing with a lot of like I did have a lot of issues being on a on a PC running Pro mm. Tools, which is mm. the industry standard. It's like. Mm -hmm. You need to have a certain level of um, software to do audiobooks because you have to do something called punch record um, and what you don't have to do anything, but it's one of the ways that a lot of the companies work. Mm -hmm. And so having that means you can work with them. So it's a, it's a level, but um, recently Twisted Wave came out with a way that you can also do this. You can do a very similar thing, the same thing um through through twisted wave which i think was like it's so inexpensive comparatively like pro tools is like which i had for years is so expensive and then twisted wave is something i do audition i have a version on my iphone and i do my auditions like if i'm traveling just like mm. with the blanket mm. over my head uh, you know ask everybody hey can you, can you turn the vacuum off for five minutes
nights in the hotel or whatever, and then like audition. <laughs> That's, That's so great. great. <laughs> okay, so where does the vocal booth live in your house? I have a I have a room for it. The whole room, yeah. I'm just like I imagined it for a moment, like in the middle of your living room. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to like not you have to not mind the mess. But like, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, very cool. Love it. <laughs> That's so cool. So it's right here. It's my friend. I should name, name her at this point, but yeah. I spend a lot of time in there. And it's a really, it's really a safe space. I've worked through a lot of like I don't know, like I, I'm a bit more like I tend to not take time off and like mm -hmm. working last year was one of the best things that I could be doing. I, I'm really, really grateful, so grateful that I got to be telling stories, you know, in the, this, this just and through everything harder in my life. It's I just, you know, I, I learned that in theater, like in high school. It's like mm -hmm. I was going through a lot of tough stuff then, too. But you just you just go. <sighs> And you walk out on stage and it's like some of that could come filtered through it but it's like it's really just like it it, it you know deal with it deal with it later but like just just take a moment and just create art and mm -hmm. and that's been really therapeutic and so um especially when you get to work with authors like nina where it's like the work is on a whole other level of like really you know a person that you can really connect to and and telling these stories that are so meaningful mm -hmm. That's so kind <laughs> i will like i want to say before i now is a good time i guess like we are okay is like the perfect combination of story and performance it was so good it was one of the best audiobooks i've ever listened to it was like oh, it was perfect um yeah. Yeah. Georgina is like leading us really well into each question. It's almost like she's what? doing it on purpose. Yeah. Um, but my question was, you do so many different creative things. Um, so how do you prioritize projects and then also refill your creative well? Um, it's so funny because this this question is basically like when I took Nina's class, like all I wanted to ask her is like, you do all these, how do you handle your brain with so many ideas to help? Um, but I, I really work off of deadlines. So it's like, what's due next? And um, mm -hmm. if I don't have a deadline, then it's like, uh, I use me, I think Nina's answer, which was like, what's calling you? Mm -hmm. Like cer certain days I'll get up and I've got a project that I, um, about uh, women in history that I've just like been really pulled to, or it's, it's called me to it. And so some, it's a, it's so much research. So if I'm not, in a space where I can put out tons of books, then I'm like, I'll maybe get outside and write some stand up material and like some jokes and those, that kind of stuff sort of just comes to me and I have to catch it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't tend to make a, a ton of time to sit down and like, although when I do, I, it is actually pretty fruitful. Um, but I have to have like, not a lot of deadlines weird. Like, I don't know why I do that to myself. It's like, I love writing comedy, but um, the other deadlines will take precedence. And mm -hmm. I think that's what Nina has talked about is like finding that those things that are really important to you. And there's a lot of people who talk about that. If it's like really important, just do it first thing in your day mm -hmm. so that, and it's great when you start your day with like the important creative project for you, whatever that is, if you can just get a few minutes of that, whether it's five minutes or an hour, mm -hmm. whatever you can afford, um, it changes the whole day. So, um, yeah, I, but I do, I do work with the, the publishers will send me a deadline and then, you know, or, or, you know, you know, the shows that I'm working on there, there'll be deadlines. And if they don't give me one, I, I actually get like kind of nervous about that. I'm like, just please tell me what day. Don't be like, oh, whatever, <laughs> yeah. ready, cause then yeah, yeah. I just do that. <laughs> I'm the same way. <laughs> <laughs> like give me a date, then I put it in the schedule and then I build out the hours and I kind of work backwards a little bit and then throw in to that day, some of my own things, but I don't know if you, if you b b both are like this when you write, but I, I feel like I need uh, a little bit more space sometimes on a newer mm -hmm. project, like not mm -hmm. taking stuff on and having to turn things down. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. I, or, or I put off the new project until I feel like there's a little reprieve with the rest of the stuff. And then, and then I dive in then. How about for you, Sarah, do you, how do you juggle so much? 
Yeah. Um, not well, <laughs> the answer. but, um, no, yeah. Things that don't have a deadline will, will get pushed back. Cause I'm like, I'm very, I'm an ENTJ. So I'm like extremely deadline driven. Um, and that kind of happened last year where I asked my agent, I was like, Oh, when would you like these edits back? And she's like, whenever you can get to them. I'm like, so like four years, because <laughs> like, you really need to give me, but what I, cause like she does us, I mean, she's trying to be nice. Right. She's like, whenever you can do it, whatever is best for you. And I'm like, okay, I'll have them to you by September because then I've told her. Mm -hmm. And so then it creates a deadline. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the tricks that I've learned is if someone won't give me a deadline, then I'll give them a deadline to expect. And then that helps me um, prioritize. I also have a very complicated color-coded weekly planner. So oh, great. I always like think I'm going to do a planner and then I just lose it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Georgina, not only she took one of my classes, but I've also had her as a guest teacher for my classes because she's a wonderful teacher. And um, her book, Improv for Writers, is so great. It's just like full of, I mean, it's, it's full of exercises. They're all wonderful. And the experience of having her come and um, guest teach in my online class, where I just did the exercise, I went along with everything that Georgina had us do. And it surprised, like what I came up with genuinely surprised and shocked me like she got me to a totally different part of my brain and like memory and imagination like I was just pulling these things out of her prompts that I hadn't thought about in years and years and um so can you tell us more about Improv for Writers and how you came to write it and just let everybody know about it because it's such a special book oh thank it. you I would love to and I agree it is a special book I don't feel like I had a ton of responsibility for it actually because it's like it's the communities you know I mean yes mm -hmm. I, I I wrote it and I I love teaching off of this and I I really value people who teach and share what they've learned in a supportive way. And I'm really incredibly picky about, about teachers actually, or where I would, would be one. And I, so I wanted to be, bring the best version of myself of sharing this information. So yeah, it's a uh, improv for writers, um, be a dork and hold it up there. But I love this cover because it's like, it's, it's like these ideas and there's this, there's something with taking improv, and so improv is short for improvisation. And I have a background of teaching that mainly my favorite to kids and teens. And because they're just, I mean, the commitment that they run at things with <laughs> and the free just will just totally embrace an idea and embrace a character and embrace a place mm -hmm. and their imagination. And like, I just, I, so I taught for years and I, thought it'd be so neat for for people who maybe wouldn't get up on stage and do wackadoodle things and dance and be a chicken and whatever um but to have to harness that power how could we do that mm -hmm. and um somebody had had asked me if i'd like if i had something i could teach to writers and i was like i could probably teach improv to writers and um i did the workshop and then the book kind of came from there and then i just uh I, I just moved forward with translating classic games of improv mm -hmm. you know things that if you've ever done improv you'll recognize in the book we're doing things that are just like yes and you know mm -hmm. a specific writing exercise where just like in the game on stage each sentence must begin with the words yes and so that we can train our brains from instead of saying no because we like to do that it's very common even kids are just like wow you learn that and you're like wow so <laughs> how do we go yes and and then add to it and so it was really about translating and bringing those games and um i was at a place where i'd been writing for you know since i was a kid but i i didn't have a ton of like writing credits and like here i am i'm writing a book about writing like who do you think you are georgina <laughs> um, so when i sent off the proposal I um, had prepared a second half of the book, which would be for story elements. So mm -hmm. I had all these improv games that would help you develop your character, help you develop your setting, help you develop your villain. If you had trouble with dialogue, here's a game for that. And I took them out and I was like, nope. I mean, people aren't gonna, who, who am I to write a book about writing all these things? Mm -hmm. And um, I sent the, you know, did the process of sending the proposal out and I get this message back 
from um, from Lisa Westmoreland, who ended up becoming my editor. But she had said to me, she said, "This is these are really interesting ideas, but do you have anything on story elements?" And I was like, <laughs> "Not only did I have it, I had it like I, yes, I had it ready." And so the, the next day, I think I sent it to her, and then mm. we went underway with the with it getting published with you know I had far exceeded my my dreams of like working with them and I'd narrated for so many books for them but it didn't come about it came about just by totally cold sending it out and mm. I, I I couldn't believe it yeah so the the games are I teach them when I do events and Nina you're not the only person that I mean I just had somebody tell me that yesterday too I'm not surprised because I, I know, I know if you sit down to do these, you are going to write something really cool. Yeah. Like it's just going to happen yeah. because I, I've just seen it in just so many, I taught for, uh, I don't know how many weeks at Cartoon Network, but they asked me to do like a, a semester, like a, a college okay. semester. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to like, how am I going to keep their interest? Like, I can't dance all the time. This work has got to really hold back. <laughs> and uh, so I told them at the beginning, I said, by the end of this class, you're going to write a pilot live with me wow. the last mm. day. We're going to write an animated pilot. Oh, cool. And then we did. And the feedback that I got from the animators was, I didn't think I could do it. Like mm. I, I didn't think, but you kept saying we were going to do it. It's like, that's mm -hmm. the attitude of improv. It's like, you're going to go out there and do something. Like yeah. none of us are going to judge what it is. It's going to be great, you know, <laughs> or it's going to be like something you never touch again, but like you're, you're going to make art and you're going to feel great about it. And there mm -hmm. are going to be really cool things. Um, yeah. Really. I mean, I did, I did one. We had, it was just random. We had all these like really serious pieces that were like, oh, like touching your heart and like, yeah. So it's just spur of the moment getting out of our own way and mm -hmm. what you said nina about working a different part of your brain mm -hmm. yeah because this is not the normal sit down at a blank page mm -hmm. you know plus you've got a timer and all the games work with a timer so <laughs> a little bit of pressure yeah, yeah. You know? So I don't know, Sarah, if you got to do any of the any of the games. Yeah, I was gonna say some. I think some of the the freedom and like this the surprise that Nina talked about comes from the fact that it's no one's going to see it. I don't have to send this to my agent. Mm -hmm. I don't have to send this to an editor. I actually just did a TikTok about this where I was like, before I knew how to write a book, it was like super fun and easy. And now that I like know how to write a book, it's mm -hmm. like so much harder and more stressful. Yeah. And so I think those games like take you back to that, like fun and easy. Like I'm just doing this for fun. Like I don't have to worry about the market. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about readers. I don't have to read or worry about editors. I don't have to worry about going on submission. And that's, I think some of the fun in, in those games. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's play just embracing yeah. play and work can, I mean, so many of us writers. Uh oh, she froze again. <laughs> All right, this happened like when we were getting ready. So hopefully she'll, she should come back in just a minute. I have a question from um, my Patreon supporters can submit questions ahead of time. So we have one from Danny. Um, and he said, he asked, what are the differences between um, doing voice work for like video games versus audiobooks versus television? Yeah, they're, um, they're pretty different in terms of like sometimes how dynamic you want to be with your characters, like how um again like the tone like for a cartoon if it's a wacky cartoon then these characters are going to be like kind of like some of them like really silly voices um and uh she's gonna hop back on um and then um but like i was saying sometimes a tv show can be really grounded so a, a lot of times in in casting they'll just say we want your natural voice we want your you know how mm the way you sound. Um, so it actually can be a kind of similar process. It's just very different in terms of how long the session is. And video games in particular are basically the opposite of audiobooks in the sense of audiobooks are for the most part your voice or you know, a voice that you can sustain for 13, you know, for days and days on, on end. So you, you don't want to do, you don't want to create characters. Like I, I can do like 
certain characters that I know that, like, maybe I couldn't do that all day long. So that's not going to be the lead of the book, you know, mm -hmm. and also maybe a side character. But for a video game, they might want that. And they want that, that voice murdering somebody or being killed. So they do these things called efforts where you're like, I mean, these are actually kind of fun too. I'm doing this game. And we're like, oh, huh. like, ha! And you came in at the perfect time. I think like I missed something great <laughs> yeah, for video games and like all the. Um, so you can you have to be careful with blowing your voice out. I've had to replace people, um, and yeah, because it can be just really strenuous work, mm. but um, fun too therapeutic as well like because you're just like <laughs> especially some of the video game characters if you get to play a villain and they're just like all the anger and you can just go <laughs> <laughs> that's fun i hope that answered the the question yeah i think so um he had also asked about efforts which um and i didn't put it on here but you mentioned it so i'm glad you mentioned it because he is <laughs> yeah, he yeah. Said the, the, the thing with the efforts is always, 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 always save those for the end because mm. that is where mm -hmm. the voice will get worn down. And don't schedule, if you can help it, don't schedule a video game recording session before an audio book. Like mm. I've had to, I've had to just deal with scheduling of like I can't do the game the day before I'm doing the audio book because mm. I need my voice in shape for for those sessions. Yeah. yeah. Sounds... And, and right. don't do anything that that uh, pushes it too hard. P producers will sometimes put ask you to, and you have to know. It's like knowing knowing in your body where where what's too much, mm -hmm. and it's sometimes hard because you get excited and you want to honor the character, or you want to like do you know. But uh, it it's not something like you can destroy. It's just you have to be careful. It's a series yeah. like it is. Like, thing to like just make sure that if you're gonna do you know some big like big guy voice who's like he carries like an axe thing and like beats things like okay <laughs> but then like don't push it so that you know you want it to be realistic of course i'm being a little silly here but um you know just making sure that you don't push that beyond uh where you get issues with your voice yeah. And and then if you are in a session, if you end up in a session, you're, you know, get that opportunity, which is super fun. Things like hot water is great. Drinking hot water throughout the session. If, if like when, when things are like bad and I like, I'm barely hanging on, um, there's a couple of like little elixirs. And um, <laughs> the woman who was the voice of Minnie Mouse taught me a really good one. It was like in a pinch, every recording studio will have hot water and they'll have Ricola. And you get your hot water and you drop a Ricola in there and mm. it'll dissolve and then it'll soothe it. But mm. if you don't have that little bit of honey when it's like the going gets rough, that'll give you an extra like amount of time to get the job done. If you're, mm. you can tell your voice is kind of going, you can, you can lengthen it out by a couple of little things like that. That's fascinating because I, not Ricola, but a different brand that's pretty much the same thing. I always buy those when I go to conferences because I find by the end of like the, the second or third day of the conference, my voice is like really tired. Mm -hmm. They really yeah. help. Yeah. All right. We are pretty much at an hour. So I'm just going to ask the last question, <laughs> um, though we could, I feel like we could keep talking forever, but that's, that's too long. Um so my last question I ask every guest is, um, what is the most important book you've ever read and why with you defining important however you want? Yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna cheat on this <laughs> and I'm gonna give you a play. Oh, okay, yeah. Because um, that was a pivotal moment for my life and really changed the trajectory of it. I mean, I was fully planning to, to write horror movies and live in a cabin in the woods. And then I ended up in a play and um, is a play by Neil Simon called God's Favorite. And it was a comedy and I didn't know that I could do comedy. I didn't mm. understand. I didn't even know what acting was or what theater was really. I'd seen like maybe one play my whole life. And, and then I end up in it with like a lead character who's like really funny and has all these moments. And suddenly I'm, I'm a person who's not very comfortable in my social 
like situation or even just my own skin mm -hmm. um and suddenly like standing in front of hundreds of people making them laugh and mm -hmm. it was a physical reaction of like and i remember thinking like your plans have just changed like who you thought you were going to be in the world is is different now and you can have a lighter path it was really an, an enjoyable experience but also the subject matter with it being a, of a religious a spiritual nature was a, a struggle for me at the time of just like not wanting to talk about spirituality and um and being uncomfortable with all of that and so yeah neil simon's god's favorite mostly because of a personal mm -hmm. you know you think you think you your life is going to be one way and then a story comes along and and changes it yeah that's great that's so yeah it's so beautiful yeah. <laughs> all right georgia th georgina thank you so much for coming on and talking to us today it's been so much fun <laughs> i really thank enjoyed you. it <laughs> thank you for having me this was really truly yeah, fun. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Nina. Bye. See you. All right. That was great. Um, so great. we have we have just the two other features that we do on the show. Um, audiobook of the week. This is actually something I do every episode. It's just like particularly um great this week. Um, but it was a book I just finished today, actually. Ooh. And it's The Wild Ones by Nafisa Ooh. Azan. Yeah. Cool. I, have you read it? I haven't. No, it looks, I love the cover. Yeah. So um, this is from the publisher, a feminist fantasy about a group of teenage girls endowed with special powers who must band together to save the life of the boy whose magic saved them all. Mm -hmm. So the wild ones is a group of girls who um, most of them have been victims of um, sexual violence. And um, this, this boy years ago gave like 300 years ago, gave the main character, um, these stars and it it basically it makes them ageless they can use magic and that kind of thing but one of my favorite things about that just like kind of encompasses the whole story mm -hmm. is their screams are weapons mm -hmm. oh wow yeah and it's just wow. it's I think it's just like a sweet, such a great thing in the book because mm -hmm. it's like um you know women who have been historically silenced mm -hmm. They've turned their screams into weapons. I just, it was just, like, it was so good. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And just what a way to show that power comes from within us and that like pain and rage can be used and turned into something. That's, that's really, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it. And it's got, it's got two audiobook narrators. I forgot to write them down. Shame on me. Um, usually I write them down, but I didn't this time. And then also the author narrates portions of it too. There are journal entries and she narrates those. So it's, yeah, it's really fun. All right. Um, oh, I didn't share my screen yet. So just give me one second while I click on a couple of things. Sorry about that. Um, and we're going to do the polls. So the question I had was, um, do you notice and seek out audiobook narrators you particularly enjoy? I know I do this. So I wanted to see how common that was. Um, and it looks like about 55% are like, they're really, you know, into the narrators and they mm -hmm. are picky about the narrators. Yeah. 30, 37% said somewhat, but not vital. Mm -hmm. And then eight, only 8% 8 said, I don't notice or care. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like, okay. I don't, that surprises me. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I have, I definitely have, it's funny, one, some of the replies, let's see, here it is, um, Bonnie Turpin, Emily Wuzeller, and Julie Whalen. Yeah, mm -hmm. Bonnie Turpin and Emily Wuzeller are two that literally, if I don't care about the book, but they're listed as a narrator, I'll still listen to it. Wow, that's so cool. Because um, I love them so much. And then someone had said something about we are okay. Oh, that's nice. Um, there are a lot of replies on this that apparently... <laughs> they, were, they were not there when we started the show so oh, here we go. yeah oh yeah <laughs> um which i agree i think that's like great yeah oh, so great and my daughter is eight and listens to a lot of audiobooks and before we start them she was like I, she has to listen to the sample and mm. to judge whether she likes the voice like that's yeah. very important so yeah yeah i love i love emily Wazeller. i love um 
um, Michael Crouch, of course, we already talked about mm-hmm. him. Um, Priya Iyer, who does a lot of Rashni's books. Um, I'm trying to think. I'll like they just all left my head. But uh, oh, what is her name? She does the. Anyway, <laughs> I can't remember right now. But um, yeah, I follow a lot of audiobook narrators on Twitter too because I love them. Yeah, so great. <laughs> all right yeah bunny turpin especially i remember there was one picture of a book i started listening to it and i was like this isn't really my why did i download why did i down this book and then i was like oh because it's bonnie turpin like that was, <laughs> that was the whole thing <laughs> so i was like i don't even remember reading the description like i probably didn't i probably just saw her name and downloaded it because i get emails from publishers all the time yeah. yeah. Well, that kind of speaks to what Georgina was saying about having to be selective and choose the material, knowing that people will choose to listen to something that a certain audiobook narrator. Yeah. Narr- yeah. yeah. Um, Kelly Garrett, who's one of my very good friends, mystery writer, mm-hmm. um, she found out she was getting audiobooks. And um, I was like, oh my God, it would be awesome if you got Bonnie Tarpin. Like, Bonnie Tarpin would be the best, blah, blah, blah. And I, I guess I talked so much about it that she like, Asked her publisher about it, and that's who ended up narrating her book. That's great. <laughs> yeah, like, that's cool. Um, yeah, that's an exciting right. moment to yeah find out who that is. Yeah. Um. All right, Nina. Thank you so much for coming on today and chatting with us. Mm-hmm. And um, My pleasure. I'm gonna say goodbye to you and finish out a couple of things. Georgina is waiting for us, so if you want to wait after, we'll all see. Right. We'll talk to you yeah. in a minute. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you all so much for watching, whether you're watching live or watching the replay or listening to the podcast version. appreciate you. However, you are here. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss another episode and tell your friends. Um, and you can also subscribe via email. The Patreon is in the description, like I mentioned. The social media and the websites for our guests is also in the description. So go check them out. And then upcoming, we have... Um, I'm, so, I'm hosting four more pitch wars mentor chat so if you're interested in pitch wars check those out um queries qualms and quirks every thursday this last episode was diva fagan who is a middle grade author and she talked a lot about um she basically had a long dry spell in publishing and she felt like a failure even though she had already published three books and so it's just like a really great conversation um to give you if you're kind of in you know the low parts of your publishing journey and they give you some uplifting advice there um all right and then every wednesday at 8 p.m we write uh we do a virtual write-in so come and join us for that um it's fun and lighthearted, and we won't yell if you don't write unless you're laura or danny um and then i think that's everything so thank you all so much see you next time everyone stay safe wash your hands wear a mask bye y'all